Hello, this is Greg Patterson of the Advisory Group, and thank you for joining us for our quarterly context for the second quarter of 2015. Uh, this quarterly context webinar is designed to help clients uh, maintain perspective and provide general insight regarding the economy, uh, investor behavior, uh, markets, and uh, other helpful information and regulatory updates as, uh, as they become available. Uh, we'll jump right in and take a look at uh, our general reminder in terms of focusing on what matters most and, and what you can control, uh, considering your short-term and long-term needs, as well as what's required versus what the ideal might be uh, in terms of long-term planning, whether you're a fiduciary or a personal wealth client. In terms of markets and the economic overview, uh, markets were relatively flat for the quarter given concern uh, uh, and growing concern about Greece and other factors. So you can see here for the first quarter, uh, domestic and international equity returns were all around the same range between zero and 1%. Uh, the U.S. bond market was down almost 2% for the quarter and uh, international bonds uh, down less. Uh, so that's a fairly bumpy quarter for bonds. Uh, for the year, uh, domestic stocks were still up for the year ending 630, with international markets still down about 4 to 5 percent due to some of the currency fluctuations in the last year. Uh, and while the uh, bond markets were more variable in particular due to currency with international down about 13 percent, but uh, the U.S. up about 2. Overall volatility has increased uh, in recent periods, in particular uh, even after the second quarter in, the, the, in uh, July, given a lot of the interesting news uh, in Greece in particular. And um, overall for the U.S. economy, negative growth uh, or negative GDP to the tune of almost 1%, uh, and primarily uh, and in part due to consumer caution. Uh, concerns about the status of the economy, uh, jobs, and so forth. Uh, several stock park markets, however, during the quarter hit new peaks, uh, and that prompted Janet Yellen, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, to comment that stock prices may be too high. Jobs are had job numbers improved, and then uh, unemployment went back up a tenth of a percent. Uh, still hovering not quite near the point of the Fed's target of about 5% uh, full employment, which uh, is one of the factors that the Fed is waiting for to potentially shift rates. And the Fed delayed rates, given some of the uh, extended delays in, in improving employment and other factors, and uh, uh, but does or did uh, mention uh, in recent weeks that they do expect at this stage, given where they think things are headed, to have the first rate hike in quite a long time happen sometime before the end of the year. Uh, Eurozone growth was up, uh, higher than the U.S. Uh, Japan growth even higher. China's growth was at 7%, uh, but a, with a market correction of more than 25% uh, since June. Uh, however, that 7% growth is raising questions about the reliability of statistics coming out of China in terms of growth. So. Uh, have to uh, take that one with a grain of salt. Oil uh, per barrel uh, went up uh, about $2 uh, relative to the end of last uh, quarter and has been hovering in the uh, around the $50 range uh, after uh, dipping down uh, below that for a period of time and after considerably higher uh, oil prices of about $98 at the end of 2013 and almost $150 in 2008. Uh, the big question uh, in terms of markets and what will happen next, uh, a couple of the big drivers are the, the geopolitical wild cards, in particular uh, Greece uh, with the off again, on again status in terms of bailouts and uh, their flexibility and willingness to uh, impose austerity. So uh, Greece is a great time a great place and a great time to take a vacation, <laughs> but uh, not a great uh, time and place right now to uh, to uh, have a business or to be trying to operate uh, 
conducting business with uh, with Greece. In terms of the uh, four bad bears, this is a chart where we've added a few extra lines this quarter just to to uh, give some additional perspective. So the gray line is the Great Depression, green line is the dot-com crash, the red line is the oil and financial embargoes uh, of the 70s, uh, and the financial crisis of the 70s, and the blue line is the Great Recession and subsequent recovery. And what we've drawn here in this gold line is the trajectory that it's been on for the last couple of years uh, in terms of the, the stock market, uh, but that really isn't sustainable into the future. Uh, the question is, what will happen next? It's in the recent months, uh, quarters, it has flattened out in terms of returns, and will that persist? Well, it's interesting if we look at this line, this dotted blue line here, this represents the average projected annual return and what the market would have looked like if it were a constant return at the projected returns. And on, on that basis, the current market is far higher than that, which suggests a little bit of an, an overshoot, maybe overvaluation. If we were to uh, draw this other blue line, dotted line, and assume that a recovery happened starting halfway down the uh, crash line here instead of the full 56%, uh, then that number intersects with a flat line uh, a couple of years out from now. So uh, in general, that may suggest that uh, to the reversion to the mean over time will require some lower average returns. It's just not clear exactly how bumpy that process will be and how long that will take. In terms of economic indicators, uh, the unemployment rate, as discussed, has uh, improved, but is hovering around the 5.3 to 5.5 range, not quite getting into the Fed's target. Uh, labor participation rate uh, has been dropping off in the last several years, but it's hard to see on this little chart here, but it actually has improved a little bit, so that's a relatively good sign. Uh, wage growth, however, has not picked up a whole lot, and that uh, is one of the things that's keeping inflation in check, uh, as well as keeping growth from happening more quickly, because the uh, wages lead to spending, and consumer is 72% of the of GDP, and uh, that's a, the, the biggest chunk of um, growth, the source of growth. Uh, in terms of com com uh, consumer sentiment, that has uh, remained over the last couple of quarters above the uh, the uh, I guess in, in in the positive territory, above maybe what the average line is, and so uh, relatively strong consumer sentiment after a period where people were pretty down on on the economy uh, and therefore uh, minimize spending. And uh, if we look at valuations uh, in general, uh, without diving too deep here, we can see that markets, current markets, the, uh, are above the average and in the upper range of recent valuation periods. So that would suggest that markets are, if anything, uh, slightly overheated, uh, depending on who you ask and how far back you look. Required, required recovery returns, it would still take uh, 6% per year for five years for the uh, international index to get back to their top, whereas the U.S. market has been back at the top for a while. Uh, this number has been gradually coming down as the uh, European markets in particular have been picking up a little bit of speed. And it's interesting as always to see how strong the cumulative returns from the bottom have been over here in the left corner with uh, returns in the 270 to 330 percent range. So people who were disciplined have been rewarded. Uh, bonds have been a bit bumpy. Uh, you can see the last quarter, three consecutive months of, of negative returns. Uh, given some of the questions about uh, when and how rate hikes might occur, and if we look at uh, the lines here, looking at international markets for a moment, uh, it's interesting to see the uh, rates that countries are currently paying in order to attract bond investors and in Greece with the risk uh, that is perceived there is at about 15%, which is still far under Greece at the peak of the global financial crisis, which was uh, they were offering bonds yielding uh, in excess of 30%. If we take a peek at currencies and the dollar more specifically, uh, we can see there's a pattern over time where the dollar has actually had a little bit of slippage uh, since 1975 until now with periods where the dollar has risen, 59% uh, for five years, 42 over seven years, and 30% over the last four years. 
and one of the questions is what's going to happen next. Uh, some believe that uh, the dollar could continue its strengthening for uh, a little while before re reverting to the mean a little bit. What's not clear is how long that will last, the timing of rates, what happens with rates uh, abroad, or a number of factors that could influence that. But as you may recall from our uh, quarterly context discussion last quarter, this uh, chart was shown in that presentation, and you can see uh, while it's very small, uh, the purple line is the U.S. dollar. The blue line are uh, non-U.S. Uh, market. Uh, pardon me. One is the S&P, and the other is non-U.S. markets, and the, one of the key drivers there is is uh, currency, and uh, so whether it's currency and markets combined, um, the question is, over time, those markets revert to the mean, currency is one of those factors, and um, uh, the euro and other currencies have had some recent improvement, uh, but it should be a, a bumpy ride as usual. Another side to the currency coin, and while this might be uh, a, a potential winner for the, the world's busiest chart, uh, I won't drag you through all of the details here. The key message here is we took a look internally, compared non-U.S. unhedged bonds, unhedged to currency, in other words, full currency exposure, to non-U.S. hedged currency bonds, and tried to see which of the, whether hedged or unhedged, in other words, currency, uh, did having foreign currency help or hurt when the U.S. market, represented here by the green line, was in negative territory. And the conclusion is that, in general, 56% uh, of the time it helped to have unhedged as a diversifier when markets were negative, which isn't a huge proportion. Uh, however, the proportion of actual return benefit is significant. Uh, unhedged returns totaled 100% in terms of buoying effect uh, whereas the uh, hedged return benefit when hedge bonds had a better result in down U.S. markets, the total protection over that time period was uh, less than 50%. So, uh, and in particular, and you can see here where the red circles represent periods when the U.S. market dropped and unhedged currency funds or bond funds with full currency exposure, rather, uh, had the best benefit. Uh, and so you can see the larger U.S. market drops is where currency, foreign currency, tends to help the most. So sometimes uh, foreign bonds are a little bit more volatile in general, but that volatility is partly on the upside and partly at the right time uh, in terms of helping uh, U.S. investors. If we look at uh, investor behavior in the rear view driving, uh, rear view mirror driving update, we can see uh, that investor flows uh, continue the same story as usual. The historical flows are, of course, the same as you've seen before. Uh, more recently, more and more money is coming out of money markets and also some out of domestic equity and interestingly going into bonds as well as U.S. equity or world equity rather. Uh, but an interesting time to have more money pumped into bonds. Uh, that may just be preceding a time when rates rise and bond investors uh, start to feel more volatility. In terms of quality, uh, high quality had an advantage for the quarter uh, in general, um, and especially for the year where you see all the green, uh, whether it's value, core, or growth across the capitalization spectrum, uh, for the most part or entirely, uh, quality had some pretty significant gains uh, relative to lower quality, more speculative stocks. For the quarter, it was mixed, but in general, quality uh, led and by a more material margin. Uh, over time, you can see that during the global financial crisis, the big market rise after that, uh, low quality had a long run. Now things are trading places, and quality uh, seems to be gaining a, a little bit of an edge, so uh, may represent a bit of a shift in the, the market cycle. This may be the uh, award winner runner-up for the <laughs> busiest slide, uh, but some powerful information here also related to investor behavior. Uh, we've been working on a, a white paper uh, that compiles an array of studies over the last 10 years or so 
that evaluate how plan sponsors uh, make decisions regarding the hiring and firing of investment managers within their portfolio. And the general conclusion is that most uh, fiduciaries, and this is consistent with how uh, many individual investors uh, act as well, and we've shown you more of that information in the past, but we thought you might like to see some studies regarding fiduciaries specifically, or those people who are responsible for the assets uh, of others, whether it's a foundation, an endowment, a 401k plan, or other kind of retirement plan. Uh, and the, the conclusion is that uh, being patient, if you have the right and solid manager hiring process to start with, more often than not, it makes sense to be more patient with a manager than to uh, remove it from the portfolio prematurely. Uh, there's a, a, a reference to uh, short-termism in some of the papers where there's a, an eagerness uh, and a tendency for people uh, whether sophisticated fiduciaries uh, or not, it's human nature to focus more on recent performance and sometimes short-term performance. Uh, and so to, to give you a splash of uh, a few of what the studies say, uh, the 75% of fiduciaries when evaluating a, an investment manager within a portfolio for hiring or firing use a three to five year time frame or less. Uh, and a significant uh, portion of, of those are, are less. So if we say that on average it may be in the three and a half to four year range, uh, only 12% use a full market cycle. Uh, the dilemma here is that if fiduciaries on average are in the three to four year range, but market cycles uh, average five and can uh, have lasted as long as 10, uh, it's uh, maybe firing too soon. And that is represented the numbers here where uh, in these other studies, multiple studies with similar conclusions uh, showing that if uh, the, before hiring, uh, firing a manager, it tended to underperform the replacement manager. In other words, the new manager was put in, had stronger recent performance. But subsequently, after the, replacing that manager, the new manager consistently or fairly consistently underperforms the manager that was replaced. So, uh, the the maybe the the most telling line or best summary is that pension funds off from one of the studies pension funds often fire asset managers just before performance improves and often hire managers immediately before performance declines so something to watch out for uh, and we certainly caution and do our best to help uh, fiduciaries uh, and individuals uh, stay the course there are of course times to replace a manager uh, in particular uh, when there are, are process or organizational concerns, uh, but if it's for, if a manager's weak because of cyclical reasons, uh, oftentimes the, the cycle changes and the manager then benefits from the other side of the cycle. So uh, a, a consistent pattern of research showing uh, that patience is helpful. In terms of the rules and regulations corner, uh, not a lot of updates here. The only is for 401k specific. Uh, th th some news that came out uh, in recent months that uh, from the Supreme Court ruling that may make it easier for participants to uh, make claims against plan sponsors who have funds in their 401k plans that are too high, in particular funds where lower cost share classes of that same fund are available. So uh, that's generally not an issue for our clients. Um, and it's something to be aware of and something to make sure uh, doesn't become the case. So we'd like to thank you for attending today. Uh, and if you have any questions, uh, as always, or concerns or curiosities, feel free to always reach out to us directly. Uh, and we'll also be uh, addressing a few questions um, here. If you have something you'd like to submit, please enter it into the question box. And we'll uh, I'll take a moment to see uh, what questions there might be. Again, thank you very much.